Thank you, Serge. Come on, Come on, babe. It's awesome having Victoria in the house. Yeah. Victoria, she's my, my hype woman, yes. On, Fired up. We're going to be continuing our series in the book of Acts. And if you would turn with me to Acts chapter 28. The title of my lesson today is The Birth of a Church. Yes. Now we see that uh, Paul, he planted churches all over the Mediterranean, but today we're going to look at a special church, and this is the church in Corinth. Corinth was a major uh, metropolitan center. It was a major city for Greece, specifically southern Greece, but it was very important for us because Corinth and the Corinthians were the recipients of the largest amount of literature that Paul wrote to any church. So when you combine the 16 chapters in 1 Corinthians and the 13 chapters of 2 Corinthians, this comes together to make the, the largest amount of writing to any church, more than the Romans, more than the Ephesians, more than the Galatians. And so this is really important. The Corinthian church is a very important church, and today we get to see how it began. Today we get to see what started this monumentous historic church and what we can learn from it today. Point number one, preach the word everywhere. We pick up our story from chapter 17, and Paul, he left the Athenians. And if you were here last week, you would have been confronted with the question of, do you love the truth? See, Paul, he met some people that loved the truth, but he had to keep going because it's like, okay, I got to continue preaching the word. I got to continue traveling from city to city looking for those noble charactered individuals, those who are eager, those who are willing to examine the scriptures, those who are reasonable, willing to reason back and forth to find the truth about Jesus. Mm. Chapter 18, verse 1, the Bible says, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Luke, he includes these uh, little world events that are going on to sort of anchor this story in reality, to anchor it in history and to give us a, a chronology of where these things are happening. When Claudius issued the edict that expelled all of the Jews from Rome, this was in the year 49 AD. So we can have an exact timestamp of when Paul was in Corinth and also the events that were surrounding uh, in the world that was taking place as he was preaching the word. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. Preach the word everywhere. Paul, he goes to Corinth by himself, and he has no mission team, and he has no money. So what does he do? He gets a job. And all of the Pharisees, and Paul was a Pharisee, they would have been trained with a trade. They would have been carpenters like Jesus, or they would have been stonemasons, or in Paul's case, he was a tent maker. And so he went back to the trade of what he had been trained in to make tents. And he goes and he meets these two incredible uh, Jews, Priscilla and her husband Aquila. And these Jews are going to be some of Paul's best friends that are going to travel with him on his journeys throughout the Mediterranean and were incredible pillars, not just in Corinth, but in Ephesus and in many different cities across the Roman world. And he meets them, not in the synagogue, but at his workplace. Paul preached at his job. I have to ask you, do people know you are a Christian at your job? Do they? Paul was able to have an impact at his job. He was able to reach out to other Jews that were inspired to listen to what he had to say and were persuaded to come and to join him and the church that he was beginning. Priscilla and Aquila were the very first converts that happened in uh, the Corinthian church. Now, I have to share about myself here, and I have to say that my first job as a disciple, I did not preach the word. I was not an example. I was not a light. 
See, uh, I became a disciple and God put on my heart that I need to stay in London. And so I gave up everything. We gave up my, uh, my degree. It was going to be a master's in Newcastle. And I was like, okay, I've got to stay in London. I don't have any more money. I've got to get a job. And so I begged God, please, God, give me a new job. And God answered. And I got an incredible job and I got hired. And then I went into the training and I did great in the training. But I wasn't a disciple. I didn't share the gospel. I was ashamed of the gospel. And I, I didn't participate in all of the sins and revelry and debauchery as my colleagues, but I also didn't speak out against it. They went out and they would, get, they would go drinking. And I was like, well, I, I just, I don't drink. That's not really my thing or whatever. But I didn't really say why it wasn't my thing. They would be swearing and everything like that. And I didn't swear, but I also didn't call out the vulgar jokes and the obscenities or whatever. I kind of chuckled along with them. And I wasn't really a disciple. I was ashamed. And more than that, I didn't really shed an example of Jesus when I started my first job. It's that I wasn't humble. I didn't really listen to my manager. And the, the manager that I had gave me like very specific instructions that I thought that I knew better about. And I didn't work hard. I did, wasn't really diligent. I was kind of, I would come early, but I would also leave early. Like I would just sort of looking like, when's, when's the time? When can I get out the door? I, I, I gotta get to, to midweek or whatever. But I, I just rationalized being religious <laughs> yeah instead of being righteous. Yeah. And so what happened? Well, God had to humble me and I got fired. <laughs> First job as a disciple, I got fired wow. because I wasn't a disciple at work. Wow. I didn't set an example in my workplace. People didn't know I was a Christian because I didn't act like a Christian at my job. Wow. Is that you? Do people know you're a Christian at your job by your actions, not by your words? See, I, I had to learn this the hard way. And uh, I hope that you don't have to learn this the hard way because it's not fun when you get fired for not being a disciple. I think someone who does have a great example of this is I just got to preach the word and tell the truth. Like when I first became a disciple, I did not have a good example. But someone who has an incredible example of this is our brother in uh, London, Yuri Zikov. So uh, Yuri is an incredible employee. Yeah. Consistently, uh, he works in sales mm -hmm. and he's consistently uh, the top performer on all the teams that he's on. Uh, consistently going above and beyond his targets and uh, mass inc massively increasing revenue. I think that he increased uh, revenue on one of his jobs from 85 million to 110 million. Um, so massively, massively uh, overperforming, going above and beyond, going the extra mile. And just, uh, just recently, just last week, uh, he posted a screenshot of the uh, message board on his thing where uh, he said the good news about he had just closed a deal. And one of his colleagues was shocked. He's like, really? You got the deal? And he's like, yeah, man, you should come with me to church and we'll go out to lunch afterwards and celebrate. And he's like, great. I'll come with you to church and we'll go celebrate at lunch oh, together. No. See, Yuri inspires his colleagues with his excellence because he is an excellent employee. And anyone who's truly a disciple should be an excellent employee. They should be the most humble, the most hardworking, the most integral, the most respectful, the most diligent, the most wise, the most shrewd, the most uh, loving, compassionate, patient, everything. We should be the best. And Yuri, he's the best. And he really inspires his colleagues with his excellence. I want to, I want to really challenge you. And I, I want to persuade you that people don't care what you say. They care what you do at your workplace. And I want to challenge you to let your excellence be your evangelism. Where people, they see you and they're inspired. They're like, wow, I really want to be like this person. What do they do? What sets them apart? Why are they so special? Why are they so good at their jobs? Well, because they're Christians. And I think that that's what Yuri does very well consistently. And I think this is important because uh, as we shared a couple of weeks ago about how God does not work by formula, he works by faith. Paul would go to the synagogue because he's like, okay, I got to go to the synagogue. I always go to the synagogue. That's why I preach the word. But that's not where he met the first converts. He met them at his job. That wasn't his plan. He's like, okay, so I'm going to go there with no money. So I have to start working. And then when I go to the job, that's when I'm going to meet these awesome couple called Priscilla and Aquila, a married couple, that they're going to be the pillars of the church. No, he just preached the word. He's like, this is who I am. 
He preached the word with his life. And this is who we need to be. I want to challenge you. Be the best employee at your job. Let your excellence be your evangelism. Amen. Point number two, God has got you. Thank you, God. Amen to that. Amen. Verse five. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. Likely, uh, Paul, uh, Timothy and Silas, they came from Macedonia with money. So now that Paul was, had money, as our brother Reuben shared about, uh, he was able to devote himself exclusively to preaching the word. Because before this, he was only able to preach on the Sabbath. He said, preach on his day off. And uh, if we are working full time, we've got to preach on our days off. Amen? Amen. Amen. But now he had the incredible privilege of preaching exclusively. And I am so grateful for all of the sacrifices of the disciples in London and uh, even across the world because we uh, were very privileged to be given uh, financial contributions from other churches outside of London to enable myself and my wife to be full-time, to be able to devote ourselves exclusively to the preaching of the word. So he's preaching, and it says in verse 6, But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I'm innocent of it. For now I will go to the Gentiles. I think this is important for us as we're building the church. We got to love everybody, right? Yep. Yeah. Right? Well, we got to love everybody, right? Amen. Amen. So we got to love the religious people. Amen? Well, we got to love them, though. Yeah. I know it's tricky, oh, but uh, we were religious at one point, and people had to love us. Yeah, bro. <laughs> we got to love the non-religious people, right? Yeah. So we got to love everybody. But we don't have to tolerate everybody. See, Paul, he loved everybody. He preached in the marketplaces. He preached to the Athenians. He preached to the philosophers. He preached in his job. He preached in the synagogues. But when people became abusive, he shook his clothes Amen. and he moved on. Okay. I think that this is something that uh, we can get messed up with. We can feel compelled that we have to just tolerate other people's abuse. Mm -hmm. We have to tolerate other people's manipulation, tolerate other people's exploitation, where people are very, uh, very overtly unashamed uh, they'll say how they will take advantage of our kindness, our hospitality, our generosity. Like, oh, yeah, no, I don't really care about God, but I'll come and I'll eat your food. Yeah, for sure. It's like, no, no, I'll cancel a Bible study, but if, if you want to do what I want to do and you want to have a relationship on my terms, yeah, sure, totally. I'll totally take advantage of you for all your worth. And Paul's like, uh, 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 no, 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 no. That's not how this works. And I think that's really important for us as disciples is that we can't allow other people, particularly abusive people, to mistake meekness for weakness. Mm. And we can't allow ourselves to be weak and taken advantage of and exploited because there's a lot of bad people out there that will happily come in. Wolves dressed in sheep's clothing that will rip us apart, that will take advantage of us. And Paul's like, no, 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 no. And this is important. When people come into the church, if they want to be rude and disrespectful and abusive, have a nice day, man. You could go to another church. Mm -hmm. I think I've, I've explained this in the past, but I'll explain it again, is that we have to understand that our church is not for everybody. Amen. Preach that, bro. Like there are certain people, they come to our church and we're like, no, sorry, this is not the church for you because uh, we believe in love and you are uh, very unloving. We believe in all nations and you are prejudiced. No, we believe in uh, humility and kindness and you believe in arrogance and disrespect and you're going to uh, be insulting. And so no, thank you. Yeah. We're not the church for you. There's, there's 37 other churches in this city that you can go to. I'll give you a list on Google. You can go check them out. And I'm sure one of them would be more to your liking, but not us. Amen. And we got to understand that. We got to understand our value. Like Paul, he's there. He's got a church of three people. Yeah. And you can understand like, man, you might want to be like tempted to like, <laughs> really bear with other people and to tolerate them and to really like labor to the point of exhaustion and maybe even a little bit beyond. He's like, nah, 
No, no, I'm good with my three people. I got Priscilla, Aquila. No, I don't need to put up with this. I don't need to tolerate your abuse. I don't need to tolerate your disrespect. I'm a man of God here. I'm a disciple. I'm here to teach you the truth about Jesus. And if you don't want it, go, go do your own thing. You go live your own life. And I think that this has got to be our heart. This is my heart. Like, I love everybody, but I don't put up with fools gladly. Is that that expression, to, uh, to suffer fools gladly? It comes from 2 Corinthians. Paul wrote that to the Corinthian church. He's like, you guys think you're wise. You, you suffer fools gladly. I was like, no, we don't do that. We're not going to suffer fools gladly. We're not going to tolerate people who want to be rude, disrespectful, abusive. Like, no, thank you. You guys can have a nice day not here with us. Amen. Why did Paul do this? Because he had faith. When we tolerate people that are rude, abusive, disrespectful, it's because we don't really believe that there are other people out there that aren't like that. See, Paul, he had faith. He's like, I'll find somebody else. If the synagogue's not open, I'll go preach. I'll go find somebody else. And what happens in verse 7? Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titus, Justice, a worshiper of God. This, uh, this phrase, worshiper of God, is the same one that's used in uh, chapter 16, verse 14, where it refers to Lydia. It says that Lydia was a worshiper of God. So this either means that he was a Gentile convert to Judaism, but more likely, since he wasn't found in the synagogue, he likely was a Gentile who believed in the Jewish God. He believed in the God of Israel, even though he didn't fully convert to Judaism. And Paul finds him. And here we go. Okay, here's another guy. And then what does he do? Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. Paul understood. It's like, okay, I'm just going to keep preaching the word. I will find somebody in this city that loves Jesus. I will find somebody in this city that loves the truth. I'm going to keep preaching no matter what, and I'm going to find another Lydia. Oh, it's a guy version of Lydia. It's a guy called Titus. I'm going to find another Philippian jailer who's going to baptize his entire household. Oh, it's a guy called Crispus. And Crispus was listed in 1 Corinthians uh, where he was one of the first converts to the church. Him and his entire household. And then it says, look, now many people believed. How many? I don't know. Many. Lots. Five? No, that's not many. Six? Seven? No. Ten? Fifteen? Twenty? Fifty? A hundred? Many? And this is important for us to remember. There are many people. How many? I don't know how many. Only God knows. But we got to believe this. We got to have faith that there are people in this city that really love Jesus. And don't cast our pearls to pigs. We got to understand that God has got us. See, what happens? Verse 9. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack you or harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. This is one of the the longest periods of time where Paul stays in any one place. Why? Because God's like, okay, this is the place. He traveled. He traveled to Thessalonica. They kicked him out of there. They traveled to Berea. They kicked him out of there. He went to Athens. There weren't really that many people that were open in Athens, so he had to leave Athens. Then he comes to Corinth. Then God's like, this is the place. This is the place with many people. This is where you don't need to be afraid. Keep preaching. Keep on speaking. What keeps us from preaching the word? Fear. Where we live by fear, we don't live by faith. And this can't be us. We can't be afraid. We can't be afraid of the people of this city. We can't be afraid of rejection. We can't be afraid of people who want to attack us. They want to threaten us with insults and accusations and with slander. We can't be afraid. Why? Because God has got us. Yes. God's here with us. Yes. God has chosen. He's, he's sent us here. Just like our sister Victoria, she shared about how God has called us. Yeah. He's sent us here yeah. because there are many people in this yes. city and we need to keep Preaching the word. We 
we see this first convert, Crispus. As we'll see in the, the, the next passage, uh, it's, it's very uh, apparent that he was removed from his position as the leader of the synagogue. Why? Because he followed Paul. And uh, going all the way back to uh, John, where it says that the, uh, the Pharisees decided that anyone who followed Jesus would be expelled from the synagogue. Mm. What you see about Crispus, what's re remarkable about him is that Crispus was willing to leave his community behind. Mm. See, the synagogue, it was more than just a place of worship. It wasn't just like church. Because church, for, for most people, is like just a Sunday thing that you do, and it's like a part of your life, but it's not your life. Like the synagogue was everything. The synagogue was the center of business, the center of learning, where you would go to be educated. It was the center of worship. It was the center of community. Everything happened in the synagogue. And to be expelled from the synagogue, to leave the synagogue, you're leaving everything behind. And what we see here is someone who is willing to leave everything behind. Mm. Now, this is challenging because the synagogue would have had uh, scribes, it would have had teachers, and it would have had elders in the synagogue. These are men who would have been wise, spiritual counselors, influence that would have raised up the young men from birth and trained them in the law of God. That's tough to leave that behind. Because, yeah, we talk about all the people who are abusive and everything like that, but not all of them were abusive, I'm sure. I'm sure there were some good, devout, God-fearing people that were just lost. Yeah. And that's challenging, particularly when you're raised in a religious community, particularly when uh, you see these individuals that you really respected that were great influences in your life that really helped you. But there comes a time where we need to be noble character, true worshipers, and willing to follow Jesus, not follow our community, not follow our traditions, yeah. not even follow these wise, helpful leaders that helped us in various times. I think about myself, and I think about uh, when I went to university, I was very lost. I was very lost, I was confused, I didn't know who I was or where I was going. And uh, I had a number of different religious uh, influences in my life. And as I was preparing this lesson, I thought of one of them, his name's Chris Dorian. And uh, he was such a good friend to me. When I really was very lonely, is that he was there, he helped me. Is that I, I would look longingly to the world because I could see all of my peers just going off into to rampant sin and hedonism. And he really helped steer me away from that. Like, Colby, no, you don't want to go down that path. And he really protected me. And he gave me such incredible wisdom and teaching. And he really trained me with the Bible. And uh, I, I, as I was praying this, I was like, man, I got to give him a call. I've not spoken to him in years. Like, I wonder what he's doing. And I called him up and he's still in the same church and he's still doing the same thing. And his kids are growing older and he's helping. And it's like, okay, I've left that community because we don't, we might not see eye to eye on the Bible or, or many things, but I was like, man, like he was a really good guy. And I really appreciate the, the impact that he had on my life. And I, I respect him for that. I was like, man, like I gotta, I gotta really give credit where credit's due. Like this was a great guy that really helped me. Mm. However, yeah. now I've come to a stage in my life where I gotta leave that community behind. Yeah. And I was like, okay, uh, Chris, we're gonna have to agree to disagree, but uh, that's okay, we'll still be friends, but I'm going a different direction in my life. I'm not gonna continue being a Green Island Baptist or whatever these Baptist churches or whatever, is that I'm gonna do what is right. And I gotta, I gotta live by my conscience. I gotta live by my convictions. I gotta do what's right. I can't stay with this community that I don't agree with anymore. Mm. And maybe that's you. Maybe you might be feeling a conflict or whatever, feeling like, man, like it, Jesus is calling me to walk a different path than the one I've walked my entire life. And I, there are so many good people in my life. Maybe they are. There's so many kind people in my life. Maybe they are. There's so many wise and, and helpful and generous people in my life. Maybe there are. I can relate to that. I can relate to what it means to grow up in a synagogue, to have so many people that sort of wrap their arms and protect you and raise you up and to, to help you. But just like Crispus, there comes a time where you gotta leave that behind. 
And he led his family. He is like, you know what? No. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And his family followed him. And I believe that these are the people that we need to find here in Edinburgh. They're here. There are people that love God. There are people who are willing to, to part ways with their religious communities. They're willing to turn away from, from all of the great influencers and, and great uh, leaders in their life that might have helped them. But now it's time to go a different direction. And we got to keep preaching the word until we find them. Paul, he writes, I am with you and no one is, or sorry, God tells Paul, I'm with you and no one is going to attack you or harm you because I have many people in this city. As we're about to see, God had many people that Paul didn't even know about. God had leaders in government and positions of authority that Paul didn't even know about that were going to be used to protect him. I remember when I was 17 years old and uh, we'd, we'd gone back to America for six months and we were waiting to apply for new visas to go back to Indonesia where I was going to finish my final year of school. And we were told that there was a blackout period. Now what this is is that in, the Indonesian authorities would uh, halt all visa applications for a year, 18 months, two years to kind of just control the flow of expatriates coming in and out of the country. And what they would do is they would be like, sorry, no, we just no more visas. You're going to have to wait six months, a year, two years until we decide to give out visas again. And many people who had gone through this period, they're like, there's, there's nothing you can do. There's just nothing. You just have to wait until they decide to start giving out visas. And so we were told it was impossible to get a visa. This was in uh, July time. And we, we wanted to come back uh, for August. And we were told it's impossible. Just plan to stay in America for at least six months. Maybe at the earliest Christmas, you'll be able to come. And, uh, but might be another year or even two years, you'll have to wait. And this was a big deal for me because I was going back for my final year. And I really, like, I really need to go back to Indonesia for a sense of closure. And it was very important. And I remember praying, I was like, God, like, I really believe that you're calling our family to go back to Indonesia. And God spoke to me, not in a vision or a dream or an angel or whatever, but God just spoke to my heart and said, don't worry, you're going to go back to Indonesia. And so uh, it was a few days later, my parents, they, they came and they, they told us, yes, well, okay, well, we, we've applied, but uh, we're, we're probably not going to get accepted. We, we've put in our application, but, but everyone's told us it's impossible. And I remember telling them, oh, no, guys, don't worry. God told me we're going to get in. <laughs> And they were like, wow, like, I think they were genuinely impressed with my faith. And they're like, wow, that's, that's cute. <laughs> and I, I don't know at what level of faith my parents had. I don't want to accuse them of being faithless or whatever, but, but I don't know. They didn't seem to just be like, oh yeah, we're definitely getting back in. It was like, we'll see what God does. <laughs> I was like, can these bones live? You alone know. <laughs> and sure enough, a month later, we got a visa. And we went back to Indonesia when no other family had ever been given a visa. Never. There, this was unprecedented. Hundreds and hundreds of families had come and gone over the years. They had never gotten visas. No other families got issued visas in the blackout period. Only our family. Why? Because God was with us. Because God had many people in the immigration office that saw our file, saw the application, was like, oh, the Grays? Oh, yeah, give them a visa. Don't give anyone else a visa so that they can come back to Indonesia. And this was so important for me because this radically changed the direction of my life. If I would have stayed in America, I likely never would have gone to Europe. I would have stayed in America my entire life. I would have, my life would have been dramatically different if God had not determined the times and places to give me a visa to go back to Indonesia. That was where I learned the language. That was where I gave all of my heart to the people. That was the most profound, influential year was going back. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that my life would be unrecognizable if God had not supernaturally given us a visa to go back to Indonesia. God has got you. You don't need to be afraid. You don't need to be afraid of people on the streets. You don't need to be afraid of, of people that, that want to threaten and harm us. God's got us. God's got our back. God has many people in this city. 
people in places of authority, people in places of influence that we don't even know about. Uh, Rebecca and I, we, we've been issued an invitation next month to go to the uh, 160th anniversary of the Nazarene Trust. It's one of the largest charities in Scotland. It's being hosted by a Scottish MP. And uh, we've been invited to go and to, to meet with uh, the, the leaders of other charities and members of parliaments and uh, many people that God has got in this city. Many devout, God-fearing people that believe in Jesus, that believe in preaching the gospel. And they're like, oh, you guys are leading a charity. You guys are leading a church. We want you to come and be a part of what God is doing in this city. Come on. We got to believe there is a God. He is alive. He is yeah. here in this city. And he has many people that are ready to help us build his church Come here. <laughs> Point number three, the world has nothing for you. Verse 12, while Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack against Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man, they charge, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Galileo said to them, if you Jews were making a complaint or some misdemeanor or some serious crime, it'd be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words or names or your own law, settle your matter yourself. I will not be a judge of such things. So he drove them off. God had many people in Corinth. Wow. The proconsul worked with God. The proconsul protected Paul. The proconsul wouldn't even let Paul speak to defend himself. He's like, this is not worth my time. Get out of my face. Get lost. Wow. What we see here is that the proconsul, he had been... Uh, up until this point, the Jews were the largest opponents of Paul, and they were the constantly stirring up riots and threatening his life. But now, Claudius, the Roman emperor, had expelled the Jews. And Gal uh, uh, Gal Galileo, he was like, oh yeah, Claudius, he's like, Jews, we don't like Jews. So whatever you have to say, I don't care. I don't, I don't want to listen to this. Just get out of my face. He protected Paul. Paul didn't even have to speak. When people come against us and they want to threaten us and they want to slander us and try to attack us, we don't even have to speak because God's got us. He's protected us just like he protected Paul. It says, so he drove them off. Then the crowd there turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the proconsul and Galileo showed no concern whatever. The world has nothing for you. What we see here is that the Jews, they're filled with hatred, filled with jealousy, filled with malicious intentions toward Paul, and nothing, it comes to nothing. The proconsul of not just Corinth, but of Achaia, which was southern Greece, he's like, Psh, guys, this is not worth my time. Get out of my face. Get lost. He drove them out. Imagine just, guards, kick these people out of here. So what do they do? They turn and beat Sosthenes. Who was Sosthenes? He was the new synagogue leader, the one that replaced Crispus, the old synagogue leader. And they beat him. Why? Because they hated him. They hated him. They took out their frustration. Oh, this is your fault. We're going to beat you here. You, you were the one who didn't allow us to attack uh, Paul. The world has nothing for you. Sosthenes was one of the Jews. He was one of the synagogue. He was the leader. And how did they treat him? They beat him. Because the world has nothing for you. Your friends, they don't care about you. They'll turn on you. They'll beat you. They'll betray you, stab you in the back, take advantage of whatever it is. The world's got nothing for you. Sosthenes... <coughs> I'm sure he went into this imagining it being very different. He's like, all right, guys, here's the plan. You're going to speak first, and you're going to speak first, and then we're all going to come forward with a united attack against Paul. That's what it says, a united attack. They planned this. They orchestrated it. They choreographed it. I'm sure they had evidence. I'm sure they had false witnesses ready to go. They're like, guys, this is going to be so awesome. We're going to get Paul so dealt with. And then he's in for a shock. The proconsul doesn't even listen to him. And what do they do? They turn and they attack him. 
This is the thing is that the world has no loyalty. They'll turn on you in an instant. They're with you as long as you're doing what they want. As long as you're providing what they need. But as, long, but as soon as you no longer meet that need, as so longer you fulfill that want or whatever it is, they'll turn on you. Fair weather friends. They're for you when it's good, when it's sunshine and rainbows. But when the storms of life come, they betray you. They turn their back on you. Yeah. Now, what happened to Sosthenes? Well, if you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This guy that gets beaten up by his fellow Jews for leading this united attack against Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. This is Paul's letter to the Corinthian church. And he says, Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. Sosthenes became a disciple. Sosthenes became a partner in the gospel of Paul. Sosthenes co-wrote the first book of Corinthians. Because Sosthenes recognized that the world had nothing for him. Sosthenes recognized, you Jews, you want to beat me for doing what you told? For coming in a united attack? That's what your friendship is? That's what your love is? That's what your loyalty is? I'm done with you. I'm going to be like Paul. I'm going to shake my cloth. I don't want to, I'm not going to handle this abuse anymore. I'm not going to put up with this. I'm going to become a Christian. Oh, come on. That's what Sosthenes decided. We got to believe that our enemies will become our allies. We got to believe that the people that come against us are going to come to a realization that the world has nothing for them. And they're going to be like, man, I need to go join that church. I need to become a Christian. The world has nothing for me. We need to have compassion. Like, can you imagine Paul? Like, these guys come to attack him, and then they beat them in front of Gal- Galio, but also in front of Paul. Like, just, just imagine the scene where they're all like, yeah, let's get Paul. Let's get Paul. It's like, get out. Let's get Sosthenes. And they try and they start beating him. Wow. Imagine Paul. He's like, man, yeah. poor Sosthenes. <laughs> Like, I'm not happy that that's happening to him. Like, I, I feel bad for Sosthenes. Like, man, like, you need to become a Christian, Sosthenes. And he did. Man, we got to have compassion when we see people that are lost. Completely lost, just being beaten on by the world. Just Satan just standing on top of them, just stomping on their faces. We're like, man, you need to become a Christian. You got you to get away from that. God has nothing for you. Or sorry, uh, God has everything for you. Satan has nothing for you. The world has nothing for you. But you see, this is the thing. The first converts in Corinth, the birth of this new church, they were willing to go anywhere. Like uh, <clears throat> Priscilla and Aquila. They're like, hey, yeah, we're, we're Jews from Rome, but we'll go to Corinth. We'll go wherever we need to go. We'll go to Ephesus. We'll go wherever we need to go. They were willing to do anything willing to leave behind all of their friends, all of their community, and willing to give up everything, Mm -hmm. give up their own personal comfort, give up their own personal safety, willing to be beaten. We study the Bible with people that they're like, oh, I don't know. I don't know about what my friends are going to think. Get out of here, man. You want to be the foundation of a new church, a pillar church in Europe, and you're afraid of what people think of you? Nah. You don't have what it takes. You're going to have to come back when the church is much bigger because we need people like Priscilla and Aquila, people like Crispus, people like Sosthenes, people who are ready to suffer beatings. Wow, yeah. Many of us have never been physically struck for our beliefs. Like, I've never been punched in the face. I've never been hit. I've never been physically assaulted for being a Christian. The level of persecution that we experience is so small, so inconsequential, but we get overwhelmed by it and people get overwhelmed by it. It's like, oh my gosh, I read this thing on the internet and it really shook my faith. It's like, no, how about somebody threatened your life and it shook your faith? Like, yeah, I told my family they're going to become a Christian. They threatened to kill me. Like, I don't know about this anymore. Okay. Like, I get that. That's, that's understandable. But... You read a blog, right. 
man, you don't have what it takes. No. And we got to believe that. If we're going to really build a pillar church here, we need to have these type of pillar disciples. You see, we live in the comforts of the Western world where we're, we're, our lives aren't in danger. Nobody's threatened our life with physical harm. Nobody's threatened to kill us. But it's not like that in the rest of the world. We're a worldwide movement. You go to Nigeria, you'll talk to a lot of people that are beaten for their faith. Wow. You go to India, you'll meet a lot of people that are beaten for their faith. You go to a beautiful tropical paradise in Samoa where people are beaten for their faith. We have an incredible sister church in Apia, Samoa. And I asked the leaders there, I was like, hey, I've been told that, that the, the persecution is very severe in Samoa. Is that particularly by family members? I was like, maybe, is, are there any stories I could share of disciples who have been beaten for their faith? And they're like, yeah, we, we've got many. And they, they, they told me about Stephen, who's a 17-year-old teenager. He's still in school, and he lives at home. And Stephen is beaten daily by his mother and by his grandmother for coming to church. Every time he goes to church, he returns home to be beaten. And so sometimes he goes to the brother's house to stay the night so he doesn't get beaten for that night. Wow. And he's like, okay, I'm a disciple. Wow. And I have to stay at home until I turn 18 and I'm gonna continue getting beaten on a daily basis for Jesus because uh, it's worth it. Wow. Wow. Veronica, when she decided she wanted to become a disciple, she was disowned by her family. They literally threw her on the street and they threw her luggage out after her. And she went with the clothes on her back and the, the luggage that she had, and she, she left. But then when she went back to her family, uh, her father was so angry that, he, that she did not go to his church, that he beat her so severely. The disciples came to see him picking her up and slamming her on the ground like a medicine ball. That's how they described it, like a workout ball. Picking her up, slamming her repeatedly. And when they tried to intervene, he threatened them to attack them with the machete. Wow. Jeez. And so they had to call the police wow. for her life, which was being threatened. Mm. But Veronica has been personally fruitful four times in the past three months. Because wow. she's ready to go anywhere, do anything, and give up everything. Mm. And there are people like that in this city. There are people that they so believe in the truth, they will face any opposition. They will give up any obstacle. They will do anything for Jesus. Mm. And if we're going to build a pillar church like Corinth, if we're going to really change the city, these are the people we need to be looking for. Yeah. These need to be the first converts, yeah. the people that love Jesus with all of their hearts. Yeah. God has sent us here to give birth to an incredible new church, not just for Edinburgh, but for all of Scotland. And we need to be like Paul. Yeah. We need to understand that we got to preach the word everywhere we go. Mm -hmm. we got to preach the word at our jobs, at the bus stop, at the gym, in the cafes, on the campus. we got to preach the word everywhere. Yeah. Because you never know where you're going to find the next Priscilla and Aquila. Mm -hmm. Maybe there'll be a teen, or a campus, or a single, or maybe even a married couple. Mm -hmm. We don't know. we just got to have faith that God's going to bring the right people to us. Yeah. we got to understand that God has got us. God has got many people in this city, people in positions of high authority, with power, with influence, that are going to protect us, that are going to help us. People with money, that want to give money to the church. we got to believe this yeah. and understand that God is going to help us build this church. Come on, and we got to find the people that recognize the world has got nothing for them. Yes. If you have a back door in your heart, you got to slam that door shut. Recognize that Satan wants to kill, steal, and destroy your life. He's got nothing for you. And we got to find the people that recognize this. Yeah. They recognize the reality. It's like, okay, I'm completely dying to myself. I'm completely giving up everything for Jesus so that way I can be a part of building this church. I can be a part, one of the, the first converts, one of the pillars to change this entire city and this entire nation. Come and on. to God be all the glory. 